<laughs> Earthbound by Artemis Greenleaf. Chapter 20 Thieves It wasn't long before Emma came in with a rag and a jar of silver polish. She pulled the blade out of its sheath by its ebony handle and looked at it, turning it over. Idiot, she whispered. There's nothing wrong with this. Something thumped against the door. Um, could you give us a hand, love? said a man, carrying four large orange coils of extension cords and a plastic box in each hand. Emma jumped up to open the door for him, leaving the unsheathed dagger on the table. How you, Steve? She took the boxes and the two cords he was carrying in his left hand, and the two of them went into the sitting room. The haunted planet crew scurried around the house like ants, stringing cables and lights, arranging furniture and knick-knacks. "'Rod, should we rig up the barn?' one of the crew asked. "'No, just an old barn. I don't expect anything interesting's happened over there,' Rodney replied. I almost laughed out loud. Then I looked at the clock. "'Una, school's been out an hour now. I think I should go check on Sheridan, just to make sure she's settled in properly at Andrea's house.' That's a grand idea, but take someone with you, Skylar. I'll go with you. Where had Eden come from, and why did she insist on shoehorning her way into my business? I could tell by the way Una looked at me that I had no choice. Fine, Eden. Let's get going. Do you know where she is? Eden asked, artificially pleasant. I guess at Andrea's house. Perhaps... Perhaps not. Here's a trick I learned in spirit guide school. It isn't common knowledge, you see. If you want to locate someone, focus on the feel of their energy. Knowing their name makes it a lot easier. Once you can feel them, will yourself there. Fine, I said. I didn't dare let on that this would be a very handy thing to know. I thought about my sister, whispered her name. Suddenly I could see her. She was in the corner shop in the village with Andrea and another girl I didn't recognise. I felt a hot breeze, and suddenly Eden and I were standing right there with them. No, I don't want to, said the mystery girl. You have to, or you can't be in our club. Right, Sheridan? said Andrea. Right, it's easy, Sam. One of us will stand in front of you, and you just slip the chocolate into your pocket. No one will see, I promise. We've done it loads of times, Sheridan said. I must have misheard. My sister shoplifting. That just couldn't be. I couldn't have missed something like that. Not unless I was a complete and total failure. Eden knocked over a display of tinned custard at the end of the aisle near the girls. The shopkeeper, Mrs Ainsley, hobbled over with her cane. That's a right mess, then. You girls, clear it away, or your mums will know about it. Don't think I don't know who you are. Sorry, ma'am, said Andrea, her voice syrup and treacle. Sheridan and Sam kept their heads down and mumbled their apologies. They restacked the cans, while Andrea made a big show of seeming helpful, without really doing anything. When they were finished, the three of them scurried out of the shop. That girl's going to come to a bad end if she doesn't change her ways, Eden said, watching them run across the street. You mean Andrea, right? Her too. Maybe I should just save everyone a lot of trouble and feed myself to the demon. Maybe it would go away then, and I could at least save Sheridan that way. It wasn't like I was doing her any good anyway. She needs her dad, Eden said. If you want to save Sheridan, you've got to save Luke. I didn't know if she was talking to me or to herself. Of course, I needed one more thing to do. Demons and parasites just weren't enough to deal with. 
And how am I supposed to do that, Ma? Eden. For a start, you don't have to do it all on your own, Eden said, crossing her arms. I do have an idea. When your dad comes back to the farm to watch the filming tonight, make sure he sees you. What? How's that going to help? He's been trying to block your death out of his mind for eight years. So much so that he's blocked out your sister's life. If he can see you, perhaps he can start to see her. I had too much to think about. After we flashed from the shop back to the farm, I was still in a state of shock. I went upstairs to shut down, recharge, and take a nap until the filming started. I didn't feel refreshed when I came downstairs. What I needed more than anything was to talk to Una. She'd know what to say to make me feel better. She always made things all right. Haunted Planet had already started filming. Dad stood behind the cameraman, mesmerized. Connell and Una stood near the back wall in my kitchen, watching Aldridge's dramatic reenactments of things that never actually happened. How are you, Skyler? said Connell. This one should be on the stage, he should. He looked at Aldridge. Hey, I said. Strange as it may seem, I didn't care about Rodney Aldridge just now. Una, can I talk with you? Before she could answer, a thin nasal voice cut in. Chapter 21 Wound Ah, Scablu, if that is your name. Perhaps you will now tell me, mademoiselle, what you were really doing in Cambridge. Why were you spying on us? Paris stood next to Una. Paris, I said. Always a pleasure. Not. Una held out her hand. He took it and brushed his transparent lips near her knuckle. Monsieur, I've heard so much about you, said Una. Paris immediately puffed himself up, spring rooster. There's a lot to know. Perhaps I can tell you all about it. I think my husband would disapprove. Ah, perhaps some of them do, madame. So, tell me about yourself. Why are you and these others here? Now is your time to be heard. The world is waiting. There is nothing we have for the world to hear, said Connell, coming between Una and Paris. That is most unfortunate, monsieur. I felt I was being watched. I looked around the room. Just below the ceiling of the far corner, I caught a glimpse of movement. It looked like the same spidery legs that I saw at Aldridge's studio. I stared at it and lost track of what Paris was doing. The curtain of legs moved aside, and I saw a huge red eye staring at me. It was the size of a saucer at least. What struck me most was the cold bloodedness of it. I knew it was considering how and when it might eat me, or if Una or perhaps Connell might be tastier. I moved towards Una and pointed to the parasite. Both she and Connell looked up at it. Connell's lip curled in disgust and Una grimaced. Paris glanced at it but didn't look bothered. "'Are there any bloody ghosts here, or what?' Rodney Aldridge was by the fireplace, holding his hands out with his eyes squeezed almost closed. His lips did not move, but I could hear him shout at Paris. He must be using telepathy. Then he said out loud, "'See here, the batteries are drained on the K2 meter. We just put fresh ones in this morning. That's a sure sign that something is trying to manifest. Paris tilted his head from side to side and mouthed silent words in answer, mocking Aldridge. 
He glanced up at the parasite, then he replied, Yes, yes, trois fantômes, three ghosts, and your equipment might work better if you turned it on. If you hate him so much, man, why do you work for him? asked Connell. Blackmail, I chimed in. There's a statue of him put up saying how great he is, and he doesn't want anyone to find out that he was really a slaver, or they might take it down. Well, come on then. Names? Story if you've got it. Is one Frau Hilda? Aldridge was impatient. They are not talking, replied Paris. Well, shake them up then, you fool. I'm out of script for this room. This makes very boring television. No statue would be worth this treatment to me, said Connell. Hang the thing, I say. You are not a noble. You can know nothing of such things. What statue has ever been put up for a filthy peasant? Ha! You may have been born a noble, but you are surely a slave now, said Una. A slave to a man that isn't fit to shine your boots. Nothing is happening, Perry, Aldridge telepathed to Paris. Throw something yourself if you have to, you lazy lout. Paris growled and picked up a glass from the table and threw it just over Aldridge's head. What was that? It seems we have a restless spirit. Hello. Can you do that again? Let us know you're here. Can you move something else? asked Aldridge breathlessly. The cameraman rolled his eyes and shook his head. Paris knocked on the wall and rattled some dishes in the cupboard. What's all this then? asked a familiar voice. Bagan suddenly stood beside me. Aha! Yet another ghost arrives, said Paris. Bonsoir, monsieur. Will you join our fate? Bagan didn't answer. I pointed to the parasite floating in the corner. Blimey, that looks like a cranky old mongrel, Bagan said. Aldridge got out his tape recorder. Spirit, are there any messages you would like me to take to the living? Leave. Leave this place, I shouted at him. I think he heard me, because he looked around. Perry, come on, wail or something for the EVP. Sound German, Aldridge demanded. What's going on here? My mother floated into the kitchen. Eden, surrounded by a pale blue glow, peered at Paris. He shrunk against the wall, parts of him fading into the stone. She cocked her head to one side, as if she was listening to something very faint and far away. You've been here a long time, Paris, said my mother. You must be very tired. He glared at her suspiciously and remained silent. It's okay to be afraid of the final crossing. You never intended for anyone to die, did you? She continued. J'ignore ce dont vous parlez. I do not know what it is you are talking about. Of course you do. I can see the huge burden of guilt you carry. I did not know how bad the ships were. I could... I would not have... He shook his head. No, I do not have to justify anything to you. But people died. Hundreds of them. Men, women and children. That's why you're afraid. It's nothing to do with a statue, is it? A lot of innocent people died because of you. And you don't want to face the consequences. Eden stated this as a matter of fact, her voice calm and soothing. I am a noble. I do as I like. I would not expect a peasant woman to know anything of business matters. Paris sniffed at her. I know that you regret what happened, but I haven't the power of absolution for you. You can only get that by finishing your transition and facing those you hurt. You know nothing. His voice sounded less sure. The parasite's color cycled between salmon and maroon, 
its tentacles spread out and contracted, while the skirt-like fin that ran the length of its body rippled and waved faster and faster. Paris, don't be afraid. I can help you, if you want me to, Eden said. I don't need your help. Perry, Aldridge thought, it's gone awfully quiet. Two things happened, almost simultaneously. First, Paris shook the kitchen table hard. The silver dagger fell and slashed Una across the thigh. She lurched backwards. Curls of her energy drifted into the air around her body, small transparent clouds of her life force. Second, the parasite shot out of the corner straight towards her wound. I was too stunned to move. I was even more stunned by what happened next. Paris saw the parasite streaking towards Una, and he threw himself in front of her. It hit him full in the stomach, and almost went through him. Then it attached himself to him and began to feed. The creature's tentacles wrapped around his body, dissolving it where they touched, so they were constantly in motion. Its red eye stared balefully at us, and its skin flickered through shades of red and orange. Before I could shake myself into motion, he was gone. Aldridge heard the dagger clatter to the floor and looked around. Perry? Perry? What's happened? He got no reply. The parasite swam back up into the corner, sated. I hoped it stayed there. Una was bleeding badly. If you can't wait to see how Skylar gets rid of Rodney Aldrich, the Kindle version of Earthbound is live on Amazon.com. Don't have a Kindle? That's okay. The print version should be live May 27. For news and updates, please follow at A Greenleaf on Twitter or fan Artemis Greenleaf on Facebook. Thank you so much for listening. Earthbound by Artemis Greenleaf. This work is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial No Derivative Works 3.0 United States License. Environmental sound effects used in this podcast were provided by www.freesound.org. Please check artemisgreenleaf.com for details of specific samples used. If you'd like to leave a comment or learn more about the other projects in progress, please go to www.artemisgreenleaf.com. Dandelion girl, watch her play on a summer's day.